Okay. The following interview is being conducted with Mr. Pedro Pantoja for the Latino Americans 500 Years of History Grant Project at Oklahoma State University. The interview will become part of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the Edmund Lowe Library on the Stillwater campus of Oklahoma State University. The interview is, being, is taking place on Thursday, September 17, 2015 in Mr. Pantoja's office in Joplin, Missouri. The interviewer is Victor Dominguez Baeza, which is myself, Director of Library Graduate Services. Hello, Doctor. I'm Mr. Pantoja. How are you? Thank you. Fine. Okay. To start with, can you uh, please state your full name and spell your name for the camera? My name is Pedro Javier Pantoja. I was born in Mexico in October 12, 1936. And I was born in Torreón, Coahuila. It's a medium-sized town at that time, about 150,000 people. And the Torreon is similar to Afghanistan. They get about four or five inches of rain. And it was very dry and it could be cold. And the main crops or the main way of living in that part of the country was cotton, alfalfa, mines, and cattle. And when I was 15 years old, I used to love to see the crop dusters playing, spraying the cotton. And the guys who were the pilots were very handsome guys from Texas or Texas A&M. And I always wanted to fly the plane. And uh, one time my cousin he put me in a crop duster plane for three dollars of two dollars. I went on a trip. I love it. And my neighbor across the street, his father was a pilot and has two planes. And he said, "I'd be glad to teach you how to fly, but I want for your parents to sign the papers. If it's an accident, we don't want to be responsible." My father didn't want to sign it. And I was upset. My father was a very nice man. He only went to school sixth grade. And at that time, if you knew how to read and how to count, you have to get a job or have to pay rent. There were no free lunches. So after that time, in those days, everybody wanted to be a doctor, a lawyer, or join the Army or the Air Force. So I make my mind that I have to come to the United States. And I have a general who lived across the street who had a farm. And I used to love to go with him to shoot my rifle, 22, kill rabbits. And he told me, agriculture is the future of America. They say, all Latin America and United States, agriculture is the number one. And he encouraged me to come to the United States and join the Air Force. When I finished high school, I went to Monterey Tech because you have to go two years before college to be sure that you know what the hell you want to do. I went over there and I like it, but I start playing basketball. And the last year, I flunk. So I have to decide what to do. And a cousin of mine came to see us in Mexico City. And he has going to Texas A&M, and he has the uniform. He said, God, Americans, you don't believe it. I don't know if these guys are dummies or they are too nice. They give you money to go in ROTC, they pay for your college, and you go two years in the army, it's a picnic. <laughs> so that got into my mind, so I said, I have to go. I was very lucky. When I decided I was going to go, I started saving money. I sold my shotgun, my 22, and my father said, I believe that uh, your brain has been damaged, or you are a mongoloid, 
because it doesn't make sense for you to go overseas, go to a foreign land, a foreign country, learn a foreign language when you have three meals a day and go free to college. He said, no, I have to go. Because my father was like the old days. The father tells you what to do, and her family has to do everything what he said. So I said, no, I'm going to go. And uh, I have a very protective life because we play baseball in the streets. We sit down outside when the full moon, and uh, everybody knew each other. And uh, when I told my people I was going to the United States, people thought I was crazy too. And I have a friend who his father was an agricultural man, and we decided to come together. So we went to summer school and we take English classes, basic, so we can have something. When I was in the summer school, the teacher who was teaching us English, he told me, he said, if you go to the United States, you have to memorize this piece of paper. And if you go to the American Embassy in Monterey, tell them that you want to get a student visa, and they're going to give you that piece of paper. And if you memorize it, they give you the stamp. So I did, so we practiced for a month. <laughs> so we learned how to read that paper, and when I went to Monterey Embassy, they said, do you understand English? They said, well, no, but I can a little bit, not too much. So I said, can you read this piece of paper? It was the same paper <laughs> that you got. I have my visa. Now, I have to find a college who can accept me. So it took me about six months. And I sent applications all over the United States. And I remember I got an application from Canada. In those days, Canada was willing to take students. And I got another application from uh, Wisconsin, another application from Oklahoma, Connors State College. And I want to go to Oklahoma because in those days, all the Mexicans go to California, Texas, or Chicago. That was the melting point of the Mexican. So I said, and also I like Oklahoma because if it's not too far away, I can always take the bus back. So, so I got a letter, they accept me. They said, oh, welcome to come to Oklahoma. So great. So I remember, I will never forget, I crossed the border August 28th in Laredo, Texas. My father worked for the railroad, so I got a pass, free tickets in the United States. But my father said, if you go to the United States, he talked to the psychology man, and he said, your son is OK. He's not retarded. He's OK. So he said, God bless you, but you can always come back. So I decided to go to the United States. And I crossed the border. I took the Ringham bus from Torreon to Monterey. And in Monterey, I take the train to Laredo. I crossed the border in Laredo, and it was the Kansas City Railroad. And I went in the scenic car that was in the back of the train. At that time, was all the kids from Korea were coming back. So they were in the train drinking beer, and everybody was happy. So I enjoyed it. When we get to Dallas, I have to take a train the next morning to Oklahoma. So I went to the YMCA and I stayed over there. I think it was $5 a night or $3, you know. And I went to go to see the aeroplane factory who make the Sabres, the jet planes in, in Vietnam. It was a huge place. So I went over there. I have a good time, come back, stand the YMCA, and the next morning, I took a train, supposed to go to Muskogee or Reno, Oklahoma, and I took the train to Reno, Nevada. And it was Friday. So, 
half an hour later, he called the conductor, and he said, you're on the wrong train, you have to get off. And that was Friday, about two o'clock. I get off from this place, it was nobody. And they said, the next train is until Monday. They don't come. So I used to hitchhike in Mexico too. So first thing in my mind, I only have with me a little bag with the basic things. So I hitchhike. First thing, the highway patrol stopped me. <laughs> and I said, what the hell are you doing here in the middle of nowhere? He said, well, I'm going to school, but remember, I can barely speak English. I carry with me a small pocket dictionary. I still like have it. And I showed them the letter that I had been accepted outside of Muskogee Warner. So the police took me to the railroad station Continental and they even bought me a hamburger. And they, and they went with me and they told the people in the, in the station, the, the Continental, be sure that this goddamn kid doesn't get off of the bus. He's going to Warner, Oklahoma. Drop it over there. So I got in the bus and we get to Warner, Oklahoma about one o'clock in the morning. I don't have only my little luggage and maybe hundred dollars in my pocket or less. So I start walking and the dogs start to chain me. This is what I did, like big dogs. <laughs> and, and what year was this? Uh, 57. August 28th, Warner, Oklahoma, and I stand in a little motel. They have three rooms or four rooms, and the room was at the end of the hall, and I think it was five or six dollars. So that was Saturday, I wake up, middle of nowhere. Warner, Oklahoma used to be 180, 800 people or something like that. So Saturday, morning I went to the gas station, got a Coke, and they have a convenience, a general store. They sell blue jeans, clothes, everything. But it didn't open until 11 or 10 o'clock on Sundays or Saturdays. So the guy, he said, where are you going to school? I said, Connors, but it's, it's closed until Monday because it's after Labor Day or something. He said, why don't you stay with me? guy from the gas station, a little poor guy, and we went to his house, and my God, it was, I remember the mildew, the smell. <laughs> and he fixed supper for me. I remember it was a hamburger or some kind of stew. And next morning, I went back to him, to the gas station, I sit down with him until noon. And after that, I went to the store to buy me a pair of blue jeans and clean underwear because I had been with the same clothes for almost three days. <laughs> and it's funny. I start talking to this couple, and the couple, they said, are you Mexican? He said, yes. Oh, my God, well, congratulations. Mexico has won the championships little league. And I said, we love that, the, the baseball, the pitcher. That guy is a smart, he can pitch with the right and with the left. And they asked me the same question, where are you staying? He said, well, I don't know, I'm supposed to stay in the dorm, but they don't open until Monday or Tuesday. So the guy, he said, you know, my son is in Korea, why don't you stay with us? And you can stay as long as you want to. I went with those people. <laughs> Remember, I am 19 years old, dummy, ignorant. Well, with we, I used to think that I was fast, but I was, and after the guy, he said, you know, why don't you stay with us and you can work with me during the weekends. I am a carpenter and I remodel houses and you can help me to carry the boards and all that. So I said, well, it's, it's okay. So I have to get up every morning, five o'clock in the morning, you have to have two fried eggs, bacon, and gravy. They don't ask you that, you have to eat it. I hate the, the gravy. <laughs> so I hitchhiked to Connors. It was about two miles, but in those days, everybody hitchhiked. So I hitchhiked, 
I went to the dorm and I met this lady, his name I will never forget, Ma, Ma Wilson. She was about 65 year old widow. And I think she felt sorry for me. And after, he said, Well, I'm staying with this family and I'm commuting. And he said, Okay. After one week or two weeks, she called me back and she says, You know, I need a houseboy. I need a guy over here who can clean the TV room and also he can clean the holes and the showers. You have to do it. Every day you have to sweep it and go into the restroom, make sure they're clean. And every Saturday you have to polish the holes, clean the restroom, and everything is right. And the television room, you have to take the... Everybody smoke in those days. Everybody smoke and everybody wash Bonanza, have gone with travel. And in those days, people have gone in the rooms. It was nothing. Everybody has a gun and a shotgun. And sometimes in the fall, they have a 55 gallon barrel and they have cookouts with rabbits or whatever they have killed. And the guys practice fast drawing in the dorm. <laughs> so, but they were friendly. They were, everybody was friendly, but everybody worked. At the, I believe I was the first Mexican in that place. But everybody kidding me, you know. They said, do you have a burro? <laughs> or, or they said, uh, how, much, how much bean do you eat? Because in Mexico you have bean for breakfast, bean for supper, and bean for supper. So I survived two years over there. And when I was over there, I never have a Coke or I never have a candy bar. I was saving my money. And after working during the weekends, I get my free room on board. So that was great. And after all the kids who work in the cafeteria, people who go Friday, Saturday, and come back Sunday, I work for those guys, and they give me 59 cents or a dollar an hour. So I went back and worked in the kitchen. And after I got another job, take care of the student hall, the student union. It was a room like this. Two pool tables and the, the what do you call the, for you put the music? Jukebox. Yeah, jukebox. Oh, hell, so I, I play ping pong every weekend. I was the best. And after I learned how to use the machine sometimes, you put a, a scotch tape and you put a quarter and bring it back. So everybody loved me because we can dance all night, you know? <laughs> so, my second year, it was better, but I have very good teachers, and, uh, but you have to study. Mark, Mark Wilson, he take care of me, and also the lady in the library. I forgot her name, but I will give it to you later, because I work every day, and I spend every day two hours in the library, and I have to study, and remember, I was learning English. and. Uh, The, the schools in Mexico, I think they were ahead of the United States because when I was in Mexico, I had to take algebra, I had to take Greek, I had to take Latin. So my main problem was to memorize and to learn the lessons. And I finished the first two years with maybe 3.1 average. but. Uh, they were fantastic teachers. Everybody took care of me. And after, I was also involved with my roommate. I never forgot that guy, Harley Reno. He was great. And uh, he has a camera. He went to Oklahoma State too. And my other roommate was Clara D. Prince. Clarence D. Prince from Tulsa. And my roommate used to go to Tulsa every weekend, so I stayed with him. And I had the, the room by myself, so I love it. And I, I was going to the kitchen, get my free food, and also I get also my free dancing and all that. So I have a good time. After two years, Mrs. Wilson knew people in Oklahoma State. But 
Mrs. Wilson. He was, he has been around. Mrs. Wilson has been born in a wagon in Oklahoma, and his husband used to trade with the Indians. And uh, so he knew, and the first thing he said to me, tell them that you are Indian, and this way you don't have to pay outside of state tuition. So I told them I was Indian. He said, Mexican Indian, it's okay, no problem. So I didn't have to pay state, state tuition, only paid regular tuition. So that was great. When I went to college, I also got a job in a state park called Western Hill Lodge. It was a beautiful place, the first state park of Oklahoma. Edmondson was the governor. All the politicians were there. I met all kind of politicians there, and I, we have a club. And I become a bartender, because I was cook and a bartender, and I never, I didn't like to be waiters because it was too fast and you had to take orders. <laughs> and, and where was this? A Western Hill Lodge. I will give you a brochure so you can see. And, and where is this? It's in, in, Fort, in, in Fort Gibson, Oklahoma. Beautiful park. Oh my, they have a landing strip, and the nightclub was fantastic. We have booze, and all those politicians come over there with his secretaries. And the first thing they said, whatever you see over here, you don't talk to nobody. This is, and they gave me a free room, and they gave me my landing, my food, so I saved all my money. It's, when I went to college, I never bought towels, I never bought wash rag or soap. I bring out everything from the hotel. It was free. <laughs> Uh, in 1960, I became the maitre d', and uh, I met my wife. I was really like over there. People were friendly, easy going. And uh, I remember one time, the guy who run the private club was a very handsome guy, blown eyes, and he has a convertible. Oh my God, it was it was great, and all the kids, all all were college kids working over there. But one day he said, tomorrow we are going to pay the building, don't come. The place got on fire. <laughs> so, we never thought nothing about those things, you know. And uh, so I went to Oklahoma State, and my house mother knew somebody, and I got a job working in the cafeteria. And uh, my roommate from Connors went over there to Clarence D. Prince. We were room together, and this other fellow, Harley Reno, he was a he was my hero. I called him the the wasp. He was blue eyes, blonde. He can talk to everybody, and he really made me mad because he make a straight A's, and he never studied. <laughs> he used to memorize the day before, and I had to study two three hours to to make a B, you know. And uh, so I work in a cafeteria. My first job was a pig. A pig is the guy who pick up, the, they bring the dishes in a tray and you put it in the dishwasher. So the first three or three months, I was a pig. And you know, it was a job. I, 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 every morning from seven, seven to eight o'clock, I was dishes. And after I come back in the afternoon from uh, five o'clock to six or seven or six, five to six. So I work over there, 59 cents an hour. That was a good job. From there in the kitchen, I was promoted to vegetable man, the guy who opened the cans and you put the vegetables over there. So that was easy. And you serve the food. In those days, it was like the army. You had soup, vegetables, and a steak or hamburger meat and a little bit jello, that is all. From there I was promoted to the meats. I had to cook the meat and Cordell Hall used to have about a thousand people. So I knew all those people over there, you know. And after the best job was to become a milkman. 
a big man should serve the milk. And I become a milkman at the end because you don't get dirty, you just go the milk and talk to the guys and everything was bullshitting. And, and the maximum job I only have it for a few weeks, that was the guy who punched the cars. That was the best job. <laughs> next, next. And uh, every, Saturday, every Sunday, I love it because they have bacon and pancakes. The only ones that uh, uh, once a week, and I love it. And half of the kids didn't go to the dorm on Sunday because they went to sleep late. So that was an experience. And also, in my senior year, I was taking calculus, physics, uh, qualitative chemistry, and every day you had lab. And I kind of, you finish at four o'clock. Finally, I met a guy from, I think it's Kappa Alpha, I forgot his name. He said, I think you're, you're, you're stupid. You're a senior, you should take easy classes. Why don't you take home economics, take a speech, and take photography, and take meteorology. Meteorology is about the weather, and the guy is easy. You don't have a test. You have a, so I took mineralogy, and that was the only class I flunked because they changed the teacher. And if you know mineralogy, it's between chemistry, physics, and environment. And you can never predict the weather. So I have to make big reports. I flunk. Even my wife, I met her, and she tried to make the report for me. And when I was a senior, I start to get worried because I have a job in Western Hill Lodge and I was working during the weekends as a maitre d' making more money. And after I realized, I said, I have to find a job. Otherwise, what the hell am I going to do? And uh, I talked to my advisor and I have a good friend is still alive, Richard Price. He used to be the director of the entomology and my teacher on uh, insect physiology. And uh, the guy, he said, now nah, it's, it's getting smart. When you realize that you're dumb, that is the beginning of the new life. So my wife, I didn't have a wife. I have a girlfriend, and she lives in Tulsa. I only see her maybe once a month. And uh, she helped me to make my resumes. And my teacher, entomology, he helped me to get a job with FMC in New York. First, I was thinking to go to FMC Florida or FMC New York, and I was also interviewed with Occidental Petroleum. And uh, to California, and also I was interviewed by, I think the company was Magdashin. They were Jewish. <laughs> And they have said, well, we would like for you to go to work in Israel, the training grounds of South Africa, and after we may send you to South America, but we don't know. So I applied for those jobs. Before we go into your career, yeah. can we go back to Oklahoma State University? Yeah. So when you first got to campus, how did you choose the classes you were going to take? Because... My house mother knew the people in Cordell Hall, and they said, you should live in Cordell Hall because we have a cafeteria in the, in the basement. And in these ways, you can go to school and only go downstairs, you don't have to go out. So that was fantastic. And uh, also, when I took uh, home economics for men, that was the best class I ever have because they teach you how to dress, how to coordinate your clothes, and we have to have a date once a month. You have to invite a girl and bring her over there and socialize and make conversation. And uh, still, when I go to a party, I see people eating and really blow my mind when people pick up the fork like this. And I can't believe it. And after you have to know how to take the plate from the right to the left, and how to put your silverware. And also, I have to take 
when I took photography, you have to take pictures, I have to take pictures of the football, I have to take pictures of girls, uh, different things, and after you write a report, who are those people? So I love it because I have to go to the football games and I go in and free, but I used to have my student visa and I used to sell my student visa to people who want to see the games and they don't have to pay the price. So they give me two, three bucks, it's fine. And so, so that was great. And also, I remember that all these girls, I take pictures and they said, and I said, well, we need to have a cup of coffee so I can interview you, who you are. But I never went steady when I was in Oklahoma because I want to finish college. Because when I was in Mexico, I had a good friend, and I think that was also a problem. That his father, one time he said, you know, you have been dating my girl for two years, and the youngest daughter who is 17 or 18 is going to get married. I would like for my two daughters to get married together. And I gave you a job. He was a salesman for Caterpillar. And I said to the guy, I never forgot what I told the guy, he said, I can't even take care of myself. How can I want to take care of your wife <laughs> or your daughter? And this is why the reason that when I was in college, I, de I didn't have a steady girlfriend. I have one girl who teach me English. I have another girl who wash my clothes. And the other girl who teach me dancing. But everybody liked it. I just took my house mother. It was great. My grandmother, sometimes we have the Valentine's Day, so home economic day and all that. And she used to say to me, you know, Betty Lou went to, he's dying to go to the dance, but uh, she doesn't have a partner. And uh, she'd be glad to buy the tickets if you take it. <laughs> I take it. <laughs> because in this way they pay for the ticket and not take the guests for dancing. We have a good time, and uh, I, 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 that was my life in the weekends. Play ping pong and talk to the kids and fool around. So, were there other um, Mexican students or other no, Hispanic they students? No, were not Mexican. I, I, but it's really spooky. I don't know if you should put in the paper or in that. Uh, the football players and the basketball players, all they were. They were white. And uh, I had a chance, when I took physical education, I used to play basketball in Mexico. So the guy, he said, oh, you are good. Would you like to come to play with us in the team? He said, well, yes, I would love to. He said, but you, you cannot have room and board because you are no American. He said, well, no, no, because you have to practice every day. You have to study and you have to, so I can't play. So I, did, I ch changed my mind. and I, but that was a good option. So I really think that Oklahoma is, is a different place. It's not like California, or it's not like Chicago, or Atlanta. And when I was a senior in college, I started to run out of money. And uh, from the beginning, I tried to go in the ROTC. I signed for the ROTC, and after I have signed it, they said, but you are no American Indian. You have to be Indian or be American citizen, because they used to give you a uniform at $25 a month. So that was good money in those days. So I could have never go the ROTC. When I was a senior, I was interviewed by the Army and the CIA they want to send me to Cuba. They said, you know, we have a special forces, and at that time, you were talking $900 a month in the army. That was big money. And he said, we send you to school for about six months, and after we send you to Cuba, and after your job is to transmit information, what is going over there? And two of my friends, they went. I never hear from them no more. So I changed my mind. Because somebody, Mrs. Wilson, half a friend, and I got a check 
$40,000 the last semester. And after, the guy, he said, you don't have to pay me back, but you have to help somebody like you to go to school. You know? And who was this? Yeah. Who was the man who gave you that? I don't even know the name. I think it was Renfro, but Mrs. Wilson, he, Mrs. Wilson, his son was a district attorney in Muscogee. And he was a very influential man, but he was very discreet. And I think Mrs. Wilson knew all those politicians. He knew Edmondson, the Speaker of the House. And, but, and also she bought me, when I took her music appreciation, or they have a special class that I took to, where they teach you about music, painting, and art. And I'm still pushing that everybody should, she bought me a ticket for Philbrook Museum to go in a bus to watch the opera for the season. I, I, I couldn't believe it. And when I went to Philbrook Museum, Mrs. Wilson knew the original owners of that place. And he, she said, you know, this guy was better salesman than my husband because we trade with the Indians for coats or we trade for blankets or seeds or guns. Or, or he used to have a farm. But this guy who owned the field group, this is what she told me. I don't know. She made a ton of money selling the skins of the buffalo and the foxes to Russia and France. And it's where he made the money. And if you go, it's closed now. Part of the Philbrook Museum in the back was like a, like a glass for dancing. And it was unreal. I am still a member of the Philbrook because of that. And for me, it's a beautiful place. So while you were at Oklahoma State, um, in fact, what years were you at Oklahoma State? In Oklahoma State, State from 19. 59 to 60, 61. What, what is your fondest memory of being at Oklahoma State? I like the memories working in the kitchen and living in Cordell Hall. Everybody get together in the morning. Every day I, I learned the habit to read the paper. And it's funny because I love the Godfather. And he was a ex-foreign legionnaire. And he keep an eye on me all the time. And he used to tell me, you be sure that you read the paper every day so you know what the hell is going on. And I read it also, paper. And I met my wife in 19, in the summer of 1960 in Western Hills. And we become friends because she has two kids and I didn't have wheels and she has a car. And after she gave me rice, whatever I wanted, and after we have a friend, still my foster, who has a boat, a four Gibson Queen, and I used to be with him, bartender, or helping over there. And everybody helped each other. And uh, the first time I went to New Zealand, it was the same. I got the impression I was in Muscogee. The farmers live in a farm and they don't have Mexican labor. They have to do the work themselves. And uh, I felt like I was in Muscogee. Small buildings, beautiful weather, and uh, easy life. If I have another chance to live, I would like to go back to Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand was beautiful. My wife went over there with me and she loved it. But also what I like of Oklahoma State, that I never saw beating each other, nobody. Nobody abused nobody. The only thing that we didn't like, I remember, was the guys from Norman. When they play the game, they always beat Oklahoma State. But I remember one time, they were staying in the student union dorm, and the guys from the agricultural department put a bull in the elevator. In which, which building? At the, at the elevator of the student union. 
to the dog when the guys were over there. <laughs> but otherwise, everything was fun. Everything was great. And uh, the student union, everybody danced from 11 o'clock to midnight and ping pong because it was free. Or pool tables. But pool tables were 25 cents. But the tennis, the pool table was free. So I, I saw. Were there a lot of international students back yeah. then? Yeah. At that time, we have a lot of students. I met another couple of Mexicans, and this guy from Panama, Rolando Porras, and I don't know what happened to him. And uh, I tried to find my roommate, Clarence D. Prince, but I haven't been able to find it. So that was in 1961, and I proposed to my wife to get married in December of 1960. So I got a job in New York. I was supposed to be in New York September the 1st of 1961. They gave me the paper and I took American Airlines first class from Tulsa to San Luis, San Luis, New York. And I met a guy, my boss, he was an Italian guy, his name was Bob Cacella. And he said, you know, I like you, but don't make you mine. We took me for dinner, half a glass of wine, and he said, you know, I'm going to pay you for you to stay in New York Saturday, and you can go back on Sunday. So you tomorrow, you are free, we pay for your hotel. And I went to Broadway, I went to Grand Central, I had a blast. And then the plane, I couldn't believe it. You know, first class, beautiful girls, Half of the plane was full, empty, and everybody was efficient. So I thought I had died, went to heaven, you know. So Monday I called back my boss, Bob Cachella, and said, I take the job. The deal, the deal was that I have to go to New York for two years, and they were going to send me back to Mexico City because they have a plant over there and an office. And my boss, my immediate boss, was from Cuba. And he went to Spain as a manager. So after two years, they told me, would you like to be the manager for Latin America? It's a deal. So my first, for two years, I didn't travel. I go to Niagara Falls. I went to Jacksonville. And they teach me how to use herbicides and insecticides. I was in the, I was a technical advisor. That was my first job, technical advisor to tell the agents how to use the product. After a year and a half, my boss, he says, you know, this is the salary of the sales and the marketing people. This is the price of the technical people. I think you should be in sales. Forget technical sales. You know how to sell the product on sales. I switched to sales. And uh, that was the best profession I ever had. And I never forgot Nicaragua. I thought it was the most beautiful place in the world. And you don't remember, but in the old days, used to be a song called Managua, Nicaragua. What a wonderful place. And uh, my father used to play that song in the beach. And the Grand Hotel in Managua is like you were in Casablanca. All oh, little rooms, but they have a parrot and a monkey and a, a piano. And Saturday after three o'clock, nobody work. They went over there and they have music and drinks. And it was like, like a Casablanca, and anything go. And my agent, I never forgot his name, was Bill McGuire. He was a guy from California. In those days, everybody was lost. <laughs> Everything was. And he knew everybody in town. And his son was going to be a pilot, and he knows Somoza. And we start, we, those days we sell cotton dust. That was methyl parathion, 
DDT, toxafin, and you spray the cotton fields, and they were huge. And uh, it was big money cut, and they used to apply it in Nicaragua 18 or 20 times insecticide a year. And I, I used to flag the planes, and I didn't have a mask. You have those pictures that you see. Nobody wear about the hats or go. Everything was natural. And I never forgot in Africa or some places in Dominican Republic, I better don't mention those places. We used to go to the drug stores and we sell DDT. And in those days, half of the Johnson powder, you take it off and you put powder DDT, and that was good for the fleas. <laughs> for the <laughs> and everybody used it. It was no problem. And after we used to sell red phosphorus to make matches, and uh, one time flying from uh, Panama or New York to, I think, Brazil, I met a guy from Bayer, Bayer Chemical. That was the biggest, uh, still is the biggest company selling pesticides. And I remember we were in Brazil and he, he said, why don't we have supper together? I want to take you. It's my last trip. He was about 64, 68 years old. He said, he said, I never forgot Mexico. I think Mexico for me was the most exciting place I have been in my life. First time I went to Mexico, I went to San Diego. And after that, I took a train from El Paso to Mexico City. And you are talking 1910 or 1915. And when you buy your ticket, it was $12. You have to buy a rifle, a, a 30 30 and a box of bullets because the bandits used to attack the train. <laughs> and when you were in Mexico City, you give the rifle and you get your money back. And you travel for six months. And everything, it was big cases, and you have to have sample, and you have to have there's a booth, and you bring the agents to the room, and you offer the drink, and you show them what are you selling. And they pay you with gold or letters of credit. You're talking 1920. So, 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 so. I was ahead. They were so ahead of our time. But I think that the American companies have done a fantastic job. So what years were these? Uh, uh, we, uh, this guy from Bayer, he was talking about 1910 to 1915, going to sell Bayer products. And they were selling insecticides, or they were selling patches, phosphorus, medicine. It was a big business. And when was he telling you this? And he said that uh, he traveled in 1910 to 1930, and his trip were for five months. And he carried 10 more train, train cases, big ones, like suitcases, with samples, so people can see it, and hardware. Big mess, hardware was a big business. And that's, and that's the job you started yeah. doing? Yeah. And it's what I learned that you can sell anything if you have the right connection. You can sell it. When I bought my store, I didn't have a job. I was selling second-hand commerce distance in Mexico, batteries. I was selling second-hand uh, overalls. Anything that you can make a living. But that was what keep you alive. This is, for me, I think marketing and selling is the backbone of America. I don't know if you have been in Santa Fe, in the museum. Have you been there? I love that place because they said in those days, the frontier, the traveling salesman, the guys who sell weapons to the Indians, bullets, medicine, food, and also you have the ladies of bad repute because you have to keep men happy in the road. And also the politicians. The politicians can sell you anything, they promise you everything, and they don't give you nothing. Nothing has changed. Everything is the same. And, and the connection. You have to have connections and talk to people because everybody's different. But I really think that the reason I succeed in my business is because I have all 
German immigrants who came to Ely Islands and they went through a lot of hard life. And one of these friends of mine, he became the president of American Sinaman. And he was my teacher and he was very strict. And uh, he, tell, he used to tell me, you have to save money. If you don't have money, you cannot make right decisions. If you become a big shot, you have to have money and don't be afraid to tell the truth to the company. So I learned that. And uh, sometimes when I ask the Mexicans, where did you see yourself 10 years from now? They don't know. You're talking, right. you're talking about the Mexicans that you see now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, when I travel Africa, I love it. I think all the people are the same. When I was in Africa, I love it. I, I think that Africa is the last frontier, too. Because when I used to travel, I, I used to go to Nicaragua, Chile, Bolivia, uh, Congo, Tanzania, Cameroon, all these places that Americans don't want to go. Because the Americans, they feel we have to go to Japan, we have to go to France, Germany, civilized countries. But I have been in places that, in, in Corinto, Nicaragua, we stay in a hotel with no doors. There was like, the doors were like the bar. When I got up in the morning, five o'clock, the chickens <laughs> in the place, you know, the roosters, and no air condition. And uh, when I was in Colombia, the same, you know, and in Guatemala, for me, one of the best experience was Guatemala. My agent was a German immigrant, and he changed his name to Pancho Gross, so he can look like a native. And we met a Catholic priest in Quesaltenango, nice guy from Boston. So we start talking because the Peace Corps, the Peace Corps were involved for me, the Peace Corps are the best. I think we should have more of those people. So we make a deal with a Catholic priest. I said, you know, why don't we come over here on Sunday and uh, we will bring little samples of insecticide or fert it was fertilizers I was with all in Madison. Little bags of fertilizers. And after that, bring a little pad and a pencil. And I never forgot Union Carbide, they sell insecticide seven. That it was non-toxic, no, it was more powerful, but not as bad as DDT. And after the church at 10 o'clock, we went over there, and after we give so much money to the priests so they can buy potato chips or cokes or anything, and after we make a hole with a cane and we put a seed, a seed of corn, and we put fertilizer and seven and water, and teach the kids how to plant the the plants, and they love it. And after the Catholic priest, he, with my agent, he said, "Why don't you put a fertilizer here on consignment, and I sell it to the farmers at cost?" So we have a business going, but. The local government, he said that we were communists. <laughs> so what years were th was this? I think that was 1975. And at that time, were, everything was revolutions and everything. And they, they, they kicked the Catholic priest out of it because they thought that he was communist because he was giving fertilizers free because the local government controlled the fertilizer deals. That was in the old days. So that was an experience. That for me, I never forgot. That was an experience. The other experience was like, like I said, one time we were in Guatemala and we were going to the port and people stop you for no reason at all. And they said, you know, we are the freedom fighters or something. What do you have? They said, well, I don't have any money. I only have my 10, 20 bucks. He said, but I tell you, I give you ten dollars and a bottle of booze that I have for my agents. Okay, fine, let's go. <laughs> Let you go. But my agent in Guatemala was killed 
for the rebel. My agent in Colombia, it was Car 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 Cabarrillo. He was killed when he landed his plane in the farm because he didn't pay taxes to the rebels. And my agent in Mexico, don't mention his name or company, he was kidnapped for almost three months. And he has to pay half a million dollars because that is the way of life. You have to play it with the right and left, and everybody, everybody has to live survive. Otherwise, nothing moves. So these were all local agents that yeah. you hired? Yeah, I have. My philosophy was to have three or four agents every year. I start with FMC. FMC was the best, and all in Madison. And but when I went with Kennecott, we have. Like I said, they have Shell, they have ICI, and uh, they were great companies. I always look for Bayer. Bayer was my competitor. So whatever Bayer has an office, I try to find an agent over there because they have a similar product like mine. And uh, Bayer, for me, was the best. But my philosophy was you take away 20% of the business of the market, and then let it go free. But if you take more, Bayer lower the prices. And after Bayer used to give 180 days credit, I was selling cash, 90 days, 120 days rough. And we did a lot of business with Pakistan, Turkey, Iran. And those guys are a different breed of people. And when I went, I remember Morocco, the guy was fantastic. And he said, well, you have to sign this piece of paper to be my agent. Now you promise to buy so much material every year and the, the, the trademark and the registration are mine. And the guy, he said, if I have to sign the paper, I don't want to do business. I, I trust you, if we shake hands, I will do it. But if you sign the paper, I will not do it. So I didn't have papers in Iran, Pakistan, Turkey, Asia, we didn't have because they were different people. They were Muslims. I'm sorry to mention that word. They were no Christians. But they are the same. Everybody wants to make a living. They want to make money. And uh, so I try to get three or four agents every year. <clears throat> so I become more and more. At the end, I have 90 agents. We sold the company three times. <laughs> now, what used to be Cosi, Kennecott, and Natural, Cosi, Kennecott was sold to DuPont. Now DuPont sold it to the company in Chile, to Kimetal, my first customer. I used to buy products from them in 1961. And after the other company, Actron, was sold to people in Australia, my agent, New Farm, Australian company. But everything is the same. And when I travel, I used to give to my people a silver dollar and a pocket knife. And I said, that is the meaning. He said, we work for the junkie dollar and the knife, we hope that we can cut a deal. Anything I can do to help you, I'd be glad to. And I, I love I coca. I met him one time in St. Louis with our senator, and he was pushing the same. He said, America can do anything if you have the right incentives. And this is when they come with the rebate. You buy a car, I give you a thousand dollars, and you use the thousand dollars, a down payment to get a car. And you take six years to pay for the car. It's the same. You have to help people to make a dime. They love you. And and also, I used to give them my business card with a lead water and a dollar. And I used to tell people, well, one dollar is not enough. You need to have too many dollars inside the box. But you have to sell. If you don't sell, you don't get more commissions. So where were you living during this whole time? Uh, in Japan. I, I spent, in 72, I went with Kennecott. But I was 
afraid. I was really scared the second time I lost my job. I was with Transamonia. It was a trading company. But when I was with Hooker, they gave me six months, and they gave me a secretary, my telephone, plus we used to have a psychologist to, so you can talk to him so you relax and tell you how to do your resume. I never forgot, I sent 800 resumes and you only get three or five percent interviews. And now it's very difficult because now everything is in the internet and people don't have to send to see you face to face. And if you, like I tell people right now, don't have tattoos and don't gain too much weight and take a picture from here up when you apply and tell your background, your hobbies and what have you done in life. But it's very difficult the second time. And the second time they let me off, I survived six months or seven months, but I call them the traders are the professionals. The, the, the US traders, they give you a desk and a telephone, expense account, and you are on. You do whatever you want to. If you want to go to Europe, you go to Europe. If you don't want to support, you don't come to work. But the guy said to you, I never forgot that. He said, that telephone is mine. That desk is mine. The credit card is mine. And at the end of the month, all what I ask for you is to have 5 to 10% profit for me. I don't care if you ever come to work. But money is the currency that a monkey does. If you cannot make money, we don't need you. And I should buy six months. <laughs> that is pressure. That is pressure. Um, but Kennecott was very good because my boss, we, we click. And after one day, I said to him, you know, no, no, before, when I was laid off the second time or the first time, people cried. I couldn't believe that people cried because if you lose your job in those days, you were dead, especially if you are 54. What happened to Aaron in Texas is horrible. That you work for them 30 years, 40, and the company declared bankruptcy, and you don't have a pension plan and always want to have something on my own. And my boss, Herb Lorenz, he says, you always have to save money. Don't put your eggs all in one basket. Always have security, because you never know what is going to happen. And when I met my guy from uh, Jordan, people don't have idea what is going right now in Palestine in Jordan. In those days, if you work on the gas strip every day to cross the border, it costs you $1,500 to cross cash. And the guy, he says, you need to have a solid Rolex watch, $34,000. Or you need to carry with you five to $10,000 in your wallet because you don't know if you're coming back. One day, he said, I went back. They demolished my office and my house and the Gaza Strip. So he has to move to Israel. And uh, people don't understand those things. What is going right now in the Middle East is horrible. But it's because we don't have nobody who tell other people what to do. And uh, like I said, I learned that long time ago that you have to be productive and you have to be take care of your family I love my wife, and like I said, I give you an article. We have been married 54 years, and like I told people, we are so different. But it's a compliment each other. It's like, I told my wife, we are like a magnet. I am positive, you are negative. But I can only be as good as my wife because positive, they get together. And my kids are a success. They don't ask me for money. But since they were kids, I teach them to work. They have to cut the grass, we paint the house together, we do everything together, and they're a success. And we used to have breakfast together, 
supper together when I commute. And when I was in Mexico, we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. And it's a time that you can talk to your family, what is going on? And uh, now I see a lot of kids that they never have supper together or lunch together because the mother works, she works, and they are not on the same schedule. So where is your wife from? My wife is from Joplin, Missouri. This is why we came here. When I left New York, you need to have a mailing address for insurance. Otherwise, you are dead. <laughs> and we sold all that junk. So we dropped a 10-ton truck, and I have a little van in the back. My other son dropped a fast bag, post bagging, and my wife dropped a Comet convertible with Michael, like gypsies. And we came over here and I stayed with my mother-in-law for July, August, September, October. And after I got a job with Kennecott. And Kennecott, they offered me a job as a director international. And I took it for one year. But after I said, you know, I need to go back because I have some business over there. And I make a deal. Give me half percent of my salary. And the other half percent is for traveling. And if I sell, you give me a small commission. And the boss, he was another German immigrant. He said, it's a deal. We shake hands. He said, but if you double cross me, I kick your balls. <laughs> and we become friends. And it's amazing that these people, they were immigrants. One was from New York, Nobel Chemical. He said, if you ever need money to start your own business, go to the synagogue and give my name, and I co sign the note. And this other guy, Jota Wilson, when I came over here and I started, he said, if you ever start your business, I'll lend you money. Let's go to do something different. But you know, and when I have my store, I have sent maybe more than 12, 13 kids to college, and I lend them money, but you have to pay interest. I call them the good father family. We have to keep the family together. And if you have an idea, I lend you money. And I remember one guy who got a boat wagon to sell hot dogs and something like that. And after, we used to sponsor with the Kappa Alpha and the Animal House, we used to sponsor the 20, uh, 24 hours or, 40, or 48 hours marathon dancing. <laughs> that was great. What school is this way? In Missouri Southern. And all the college kids, we were invited to the, the toga party, the Godfather party, and after they had one time Parents' Day, and they dedicated a football game from my wife, and they were, okay, so that was good. But you know, I, I love college kids, but now I come in different. I, th I think they are, they are no, I don't know if they have lost direction or the families are part or the pressure of living is very different. So the fact that you were from Mexico, yeah. how did that affect your career as you were going? I, I, I really, my personal opinion, the Mexicans have to work twice as hard as the Americans because I was a good salesman and somebody was promoted. And I didn't like that. But my boss, he said, listen, sometimes you have to eat shit and go with the flow. <laughs> don't, don't fight the system, go with the flow. Because at the bottom line, the companies, what they see is profit. But it's a lot of politics, because when I was, I don't mention the company, the big boss, he never, he, he never invited me for lunch alone. He invited when I have my agents. And I remember one time he came to see me and he said, you know, this guy who won the Trevino, the golf, he was a good Mexican. He's like you, and I, said, and I said, I hate to tell you, but if I have to give you a raise, 
I will give you a raise because the way you dress, because in New York you dress perfect. You have to dress for the occasion. And, uh, and we used to train our salesmen. One time we were with New Farm and uh, we went to Laredo, Texas. And uh, the guy who said, how can we train people like you? I said, very simple. We cross the border, take away the wallet, and then uh, you have to come back in the next two hours with 50 bucks in your pocket. I said, it. people go, they sell the washers, the shirt, anything. <laughs> if you, this is what survive. Uh, some people don't know how to do it. So you mentioned sending uh, or uh, lending money to 12 students. Have you done a lot of working with students over the years? Yes, I, I tell you, I, my wife is very good with that too. We, we bought several houses and my wife bought that house. We didn't have windows, nothing, and we succeeded. Everybody thinks that we were crazy. And at the beginning I thought, I don't want to live over there, it's a monster house. But I really think that in life you have to take chances even right now, I don't know where I'm going now because all my friends are dying. <laughs> all my friends, you know, I, you cannot take care of yourself no more. I now talk in Oklahoma State about the place for retirement people. I have a place over here called Lesbio Minor. And you get to the point in life that you have the place where to go. You cannot take care of yourself no more. I, I, my wife, she has been active all his life, but she has arthritis, she's anemic, and I have to do my exercise every day because my back, and uh, now I have my ears, and I just, I told my doctor, I would like for you to give me a shot of Viagra and esteroids every month. <laughs> they gave me one for the hay fever. I could not sleep for two days. Your mind go crazy, Yet, and you think, about all the places that you have been, why? And uh, you talk to other people and say, I don't dream. You don't dream. And I say, half of my life has been dreaming. <laughs> so you mentioned that uh, you said people have to take risks. What's the biggest risk you've taken? I think the biggest risk is one time I went to Ivory Coast and I didn't have passport. I didn't have a visa. And uh, I have this guy, Gil, Gil Dangla. He was a very good guy, French. He said, no, 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 no don't worry, don't worry. And I think they took away my passport. And I gave the guy 50 bucks. And uh, next day, I come back, they give me my passport. But if you don't get a passport, you're dead. And another time, flying from Uganda, the same. I didn't have a visa for Uganda. And uh, the guy said uh, in the morning, where is my passport? Oh, hell, it's in the office. And the office is about 45 minutes, and the plane is leaving in an hour. So I have to get a car. and. I have to tell the guy I've got 50 bucks in the taxi to go all the way. If you get a ticket, I'll pay you. We come back. We went to the main place in Douala, in Uganda, to get my passport, come back, and get in the plane. And why did you go to these two places? Because I have to sell my product and coffee or tomatoes. I have to go, and I didn't have my visa. Because if you travel during the weekend, the embassies are closed. And my agents sometimes, they are crazy too. And the other time, it was in El Salvador. I went to El Salvador, and in that time, it was the revolution. And uh, I used to have a good agent, Gabriel Montenegro, a very influential guy. And uh, I took my weight wash, and it was, it was a time, it's something maybe 60, 70 bucks. I told the guy in immigration, listen, you keep the wash and you close your eyes and I'll be back in two hours. 
We went over there, we signed the contract and come back, and you said, you keep the watch. This is it. And also, what people don't realize, like when I was in El Salvador, you go on the road and you see people dead on the middle of, on the side of the road. And they say, what the hell? They say, well, we keep it over there to scare the terrorists. And this way, you say, they don't have to, they have to scare them. I, I, I never felt bad in the summer, never. What years were this? That was in 19, 1968 to 74, 75. And I remember another time in Nicaragua. We used to go, all the places where they have revolutions, remember, they have to eat. They have coffee, they have cotton, they have cocoa, and they have to sell it. And they keep my agent. It was McGuire, uh, they kicked him out because he was a gringo, so they kicked him out from the revolution. So I went to the company Proagro. It was the company who buy the products for the farmers in Nicaragua. And I went to the office. I couldn't believe it. They have the picture of Jesus Christ in the back over here. The right was the picture of John F. Kennedy, and in the left side was the picture of Lenin. <laughs> Why do you think they have those things? Because they think that if you are a Christian, you are good. And John F. Kennedy, he was so pro, he was the best salesman in Latin America. They love that guy. And Lenin, he said, because he gave us opportunity socialists. And after the guy, he said, have you ever shoot an M16? No. Well, let's go. Let's go in the back. <laughs> and shoot a rifle. But you get an order. <laughs> you have to do those things with a film. And that really blew my mind. And uh, everybody is the same. Really, it's the same. And. Uh, as long as everybody likes you or, or you do favors for people, e everything moves. Another time, we used to go to Tanzania and Ethiopia. In those days, it was the third world countries. I remember the Cold War. And I remember one time we were in Tanzania, and I'm in a stable like here, and it was only beans or rice, and this is all what you eat because the restaurant, and it was a first class hotel, but they're, they're controlled. The next guys over there, they said, they said to me, are you CIA? He said, no, 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 I'm a CIA. I am an agricultural advisor. I sell pesticides and everything. Oh, God, I like you because we're agricultural advisors too. You want to share vodka with us? So, John Kirsten and myself, we went over there, and we have a shot of vodka and have supper with them. But they were doing the same. And, but the Russians, they were trying to sell communists, but also they give the farmers rifles, and they try to give them a little bit fertilizer, but they, tell, they try to make them more socialist. And the Americas, we were trying to give them fertilizer, seeds, and education, but everything got together. And the Peace Corps were fantastic. The Peace Corps were the best. I wish we could have more people like that. But now people are afraid they don't want to go. Were you ever involved in the Peace Corps? Yeah, I was involved with the Peace Corps in uh, Peru. I was involved with the Peace Corps in Guatemala. We were involved in Bolivia. And we give them samples, and they give it to the poor people, the farmers. Yeah. So you you were um, supplying these people from the Peace Corps, so they could then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you see, because my main co my 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 object was to promote my product, so the people feel it and they know it. And after, in Africa, and we start to sell it that way. We make it in 50 gram sachets. And everybody thought that we were crazy. But that was the way, because you put one sachet in the back sprayer, 
and those people work from 7 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock with a backpack. I cannot do it no more. I used to have three of those backpack sprayers over here. I cannot do it no more. And those people do. And I never remember one lady, her name was Charlotte Garfield. She's another immigrant from Germany. I met her in Tanzania. And Tanzania, it was a big business. You were talking 28 million, 40 million dollars business. And she go to the fifth floor of the hotel, pick up the sprayer, threw it to the floor, pick it up, fill it up with water, this and spray. He said, this goddamn machine doesn't break under the most tough conditions. You have to buy this. <laughs> I never forgot. I never forgot. Because, you know, this is the way you sell in the third world countries. And uh, so many adventures that uh, it's hard to believe, you know. And uh, like I said, I love, we used to fly Concorde sometimes, Concorde, because everything was so fast. We go, I go to Douala or Cameroon, have dinner with the Minister of Agriculture or the people over there, and still I keep in touch with uh, Dr. Bonji, who was the director of the Agricultural Department. Still we communicate. And uh, I took the plane, went back, I took the, the Concorde, and we went to Paris, and after that I took the, in Paris, I saw my agent, Calliop, and the agent, we come back to the World Trade Center with it. And in those days, in 1961, only shale, oil, somitomo, they have internal communications that you could call the country without the help of the operator. And I remember when we were in Paris, and in New York, Delta, you pushed the telephone and you talk to the agent in Australia. And they say, what is the price of urea? What is the best price that you can get for urea? And now they, they call Indonesia. What is the largest price over there? And after they call, the other guy called, they call Brazil. What is the price of urea or the insecticide? And after we compare the prices, but we're talking today, marketing information. And after they said, what do you think is the price going to be? And after he said, well, I'd say this price, uh, what are the rebates that we have to give? So, so much. So, it's a deal, it's a deal. Okay. And after, I remember one time, I, I called Joe Tagwison, the guy from Chemical, at like one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock. And I said, are you crazy? He said, no. He said, the tender is going to be closed tomorrow at 10 o'clock. It's going to be 700 tons in bulk. We're talking 5 million bucks. And we have to be sure that everybody play the game. So we get that share, competition, get the other place, but everything is OK. And then the guy who said, you do, you do whatever you want to, but I never hear this conversation. I don't even know you. You go ahead. <laughs> this is the way. It's, it's, it's so fast, and people don't realize. So going back, you came from Mexico to the United States for college and then started yeah. working. Did you become a citizen? Yeah. I become a citizen. But remember, when I cross the border, this is what... Sometimes I get upset. When I crossed the border the first time, no, the, sec the first time was so easy because the student. Second time, they have to put in the New York time for the unions to say, we are going to hire this person. These are the qualifications. And if the unions have somebody like that, they apply, and you are behind. Luckily, luckily nobody has something like me, entomology degree, agronomy, speak, Spanish-speaking country. And I went by myself to Laredo. I crossed the border, and I went to Monterrey. 
and I have all my papers ready. You have to have the blood test. You need to fill it out the question that you are not communist, and <laughs> they don't ask you like, that you are not homosexual, that you have not committed adultery, that you don't have a social disease, and you have to bring your blood test. So you hang it in your neck with a coat. So when I went to the American embassy, I told the guys that I have to be September the 1st, and it was already July or something. He said, they start laughing. He said, we have about 10,000 people ahead of you. It's going to be at least seven months or a year. So get out. You better, you better get a part-time job over here. I was so upset. And when I went out of the, uh, the American embassy, he come an old friend of mine, the coach from Monterrey Tech, my basketball coach worked in the embassy. And I tell him what happened. He said, well, can you? He said, this is true. You're in the shit house. I said, I, I said my wife, I want to get married in Jolton next week, and after that, I have to go to, to New York. And after that, I told the guy, you know, if you do me a favor, I said, I have money in Oklahoma. I can write you a check, and it's good. Uh, I give you 250 bucks. And he said, okay, I'll do whatever I can do. Next day, uh, that night, I called my wife because I said, you have to have a college degree, you have to have a, a job, you have to be clean, and you have to swear that you are no communist or left wing. So I have signed those. And, but if you have an American wife, it gives you a preferential thing. So I called my wife at night, and I said, Alice, you better come to, to Laredo, because that will help. And uh, she took the bus, Greyhound, to Laredo. That afternoon, I had dinner with my football coach, and he said, I think I can help you, and he put my papers on the top. I was the second day they mentioned in the bulletin. I am in. <laughs> My wife is coming in the green handbooks. So I went to shine my shoes. And I told, the, I went, I never forgot, I went to the Catholic Church and my wife, a Baptist, I went to the Baptist Church. And they said, how much do you charge for a wedding? I never forgot that, 1995. Why 1995? <laughs> and the Baptist the same. Oh shit. And after, when I shined my shoes, I told the guy, where did you get married over here? How do you, how do, can you afford to get married? He said, my, my cousin is a judge, and he can marry you for 350. Let's go to meet your cousin. So I met a cousin, I paid him, I called my wife. Next day, my wife arrived at 11 o'clock. I have my blood test, Alice had her blood test. We were married in 20 minutes. What year was this? In 1961, July 22nd. But I have to cross the border illegally because my papers, my papers were in Monterey. So was that? So I told my wife, legally we are not married because my papers were over there, so I'm not legally married to you. So we got married in, in no time at all. So the next day we took my, my, my Greenham bus to Monterey. The second day, we spent over there, I went to the embassy, they had my papers ready. So how long after graduating from OSU was this? Come in. How long after graduating from OSU was this? Oh, I got, I got married, I got graduated from Oklahoma May 28th, and I got married July 22nd. And by July 28th, or August the 1st, I have my passport and everything ready. And after we came to Joplin, and I didn't know, I didn't have a driver's license. Alice had a car, a Mercury, beautiful car, <coughs> 52, no tank. We drove with no insurance, and I don't have a driver's license. And we went to New York, no problem. And we stayed, I never forgot, in the Two Door City Hotel, next to the United Nations. And it was $16 a night. So. 
and they give me a week to find a house. And I told my wife, I think we should go to New Jersey because it's cheaper. No, my, I don't know. No. I want to live in Connecticut. I like Connecticut because there's no a bunch of bull. So we went to Connecticut and we found a beautiful, no, an old house, but it was two floors. And the lady <coughs> who lived in the first floor was a retired lady, the divorced. And she said, yeah, but you can rent the same place for $395 or something like that. So I tried to chisel them a little bit, you know, I don't have much. So we got a place. We went back to Connecticut. The next day, we couldn't find Connecticut. It was Wilton, Connecticut. It was a beautiful town, beautiful place, but expensive. But it was a good experience. And I commute from Wilton to New York every day. And I commute for 12 years, and it's funny. When you commute, this is where I have that, that picture over here. In 12 years, you never talk to the next guy to you, never. You read the paper, when you go to New York, you read the New York Times or Wall Street Journal. When you come back, you read the daily news to see what the hell about it. And you do your homework and take a nap. On Friday, you get a beer for 50 cents a dollar, you have a beer, and you have put your at the checkcase, you're happy. And the trains always leave on time, but never arrive on time. They're always late. And my wife, like I said, I give her credit because she picked me up for one year. And uh, the second year, we moved to a better place because it was too far away. We moved to Sun Norwalk. It was better, but it's not the same. A Mickey Mouse house, two bedrooms, and I have three kids. I mean, not two kids. I didn't have Michael. And the kids were fantastic. They, they were all, but I feel sorry for them. But in New York, you don't talk to the next guy. You have to read that. You don't, and I remember one time, it came a friend of mine. And he said, you know, you have to let me in advance that you're coming because we have schedules. He's kind of here, I'm here. And when people used to come to my house in Connecticut, sometimes I used to put a timer for half an hour and you have to go home because we have to eat supper, watch Johnny Carson, 11 o'clock go to bed, five o'clock you get up and you have to control your system because you go in the train it was a train, horrible. Sometimes the air condition works, sometimes they don't work. And it's shitty. Uh, at one time, I broke my leg commuting. And nobody in the train stopped to help you. Nobody. Finally, the conductor, he said, what happened to you? He said, oh shit, you broke your leg. But I'm sorry, we have to leave. I'm calling the police to come and pick you up. So the police came up and picked me up, take me to the emergency room. There were about six, seven people in line. And the leg from my cup, my wheelchair fall down. So I'm with my good leg in the floor and the back leg in the top. And uh, they came two guys, they put a wheel, they kick it, and it's okay. So I was telling the doctor what happened. He said, oh shit. Your brain has been damaged. I don't believe your story at all. <laughs> and after he take a cigar and a smoke in the emergency room in Norwalk. And after he said to the next girl to me, hey honey, after I fix this, this stupid commuter, I'm going to Florida for a weekend. You want to come along? <laughs> this is the real world of America. People don't believe me, but this is America. That was so wackles. But how a person like me get involved with those wackles? Because I am one of them. And you have to, I really think that you have to know people to see what is going on. So in your time in the United States, have you worked with um, communities of Mexican-Americans or yes. Latinos? I got involved when my Catholic priest uh, 
One is a Mexican, Daniel Robles. I used to have another guy, but all those Catholic priests, they finish in the cuckoo farm <laughs> because too much pressure. And my sister Francine, I love my sister Francine. I work in Web City to promote English and healthy Mexicans to get a job. And I brought the Mexican council over there t three times. And the first time, they give 169 passports or visas because most of the Mexicans, they have no driver's license, they don't have birth certificates, they don't have driver's license. And I, we start to teach in Gringo 101. It's a book that you teach with pictures. Don't worry about the grammar. One picture is about supermarket. The other picture is going to see a doctor. The other picture is about a mechanic. And I work in the community clinic for about three years. And I give you reports. You have all the reports and the papers. And uh, but for one reason or another, the Mexicans and the community don't get together. And also, you have a report over there that I sent to the governor. I have a picture with the governor, Mr. Conahan. And uh, I went with him to Chile, Brazil, Argentina, and he made me director for financial advice for Missouri. And uh, I love the guy, but he died in a plane accident. If he had been alive, I wouldn't be working for him because he cared about the people. He cared. At that time, we were selling the satellites for Latin America and the M16 and college education and vegetables, corn for Missouri. And this is what I really think that I'm involved with NAFTA. Also, I was become the director for the agricultural division of Missouri because Mexico is probably number one, number two or three. Canada is number one, Mexico is number two. They passed already Japan. And I have the Mexican Council with Missouri Southern and they were going to offer 6,000 scholarships for Mexican American. You should meet the Mexican Council in Kansas City. But the condition is that if you finish college over here, you have to go to Mexico for two years because Mexico has close to 6,200 plants. If you go to Monterrey, Guadalajara, Saltillo, and uh, MCI over here has the biggest warehouse in Laredo, Texas. And it's a big future, but like I said, it's the communications, and I went to the Mexican Commission, and I told them what we have to do is talk one-to-one -one basis with your state representatives. I went to Washington with Roy Blunt and talked about that, and I have been for two years. I was in Jefferson City every year, but you have to talk how are we going to get working permits for the Mexicans here? The Mexicans do not want social labor, they don't want food stuff. All what they want is a chance to work. And one that you work, you pay your taxes and get your driver's license. Right now, I talked to Steve McIntosh, he's a Roy Blunt right hand for Jordan. He said, I would like to take you to Laredo, Texas, and we cross the border and legally in two, uh, two days, so I can show you how it is done. He said, no, I'm afraid that you never bring me back. <laughs> no, I have to bring you back. <laughs> and uh, I said, no, it's so simple. Maybe I should not talk about this thing, but you can cross the border if you buy seven, eight thousand dollars right now, you cross the border 10 o'clock in the morning in a bank. If you pay less than three thousand, you pass other ways. I don't tell you right now, but you pass. And if you want to buy a fake driver license, you can buy one for 
$5,000 or $3,000 or less. And when we have the Mexican Council, we have so many people from Guatemala, they are Mexicans. And I say, what, what are you from? What is the name of the city? Uh, what is the name of the capital? The little short guys. It's this is going on. A lot of people from Central America, they think they are Mexicans because they said it's easy to cross the border. So, so what years were you involved with the Missouri Commission? What? What years were you involved with the Missouri Commission? Uh, two years ago. And with the Catholic Church, I was involved with them about 10 years ago. You have papers in the newspaper over there, and they tell you everything. And I have four pages how we should do it in America. Because America needs working class people. And uh, the average American don't like to cut the grass. They don't like to fix the roofs. I, I was teaching that. First, I want to be a welder. When I came to the United States, I went to go to Alaska because they were paying $19 an hour. That was big money. And I learned how to weld. And, uh, but I didn't like those kind of people. And uh, I really think that the welding, roofing, I, I'm pushing that the technical school, they should buy an old house and the kids or the people teach them how to put it together and we sell it and they give the profit to the kids and I have a couple of Mexicans and a lot of people they want subsidy for one reason or another don't quote me but people learn a lot of bad habits in California like I don't believe that you should have a kid because if you have a kid you get subsidy from the government and they give you money every month. I, don't, I will not have a kid because of that reason. And uh, I will not have more kids. Like in Canada, the more kids you have, less taxes you pay. But Canada is 34 million people. America is 330. And uh, I really think that the technical school, they should get more involved. But uh, this is my philosophy. I, you have a report that I sent to the governor and to the commission over here. And uh, I think the future of NAFTA is great, but you have to really get people dedicated to improve the Mexicans or improve the relations with the United States. So what's the thing that you're most proud of for working with Mexicans? I think for me is the satisfaction I get because when I came to this country, I would have never succeed like the guy who allowed me to stay in his house the first night. God, it's amazing. And the police picked me up. They didn't take me to jail or anything. And when the guy in Oklahoma lent me the money, and when I work in Oklahoma State in the cafeteria, everybody was friendly. And everybody mixed. But I, don't, I didn't see too many free lawyers like I see sometimes now. I have a kid over here living in one of my cabins, about oh, say 23 years old, have borrowed already $60,000 going to school, and he lost his job. And he went back to St. Louis because they closed his job with a, I think, Federal Express. And I really think that people who work for the subsidy, I think it's horrible. I think you should be help people, but no forever. And try to find out what is the talent of these people. I think they, I made a comment the other day that they didn't went very smooth. The Catholic Church is losing a lot of those people because now you have all those people after six months, you become a minister, and they have Mexicans working over there, they care of the, and uh, they don't teach them English. They don't teach them customs. This is what I think that, in a certain way, politics and the relations and even the Chamber of Commerce has to get involved with those people. How did you first learn about customs when you came to the United States? Excuse me? 
How did you first learn about customs when you came to the United States? Well, I think that my father and my cousin never went to come to the United States. My father, he said, I think you are crazy. And I have another friend of mine, my cousin, who has a son, and to them, he said, swear by your mother that you are never going to invite my son or my daughters to the United States. I don't want to lose them. I have another guy from Argentina. I tried to get him a scholarship to go to school over here, and the mother told me the same. I don't want my daughter to come to stay. It's, it's how do you feel yourself? My friend from Mexico, they think I'm crazy living over here. He said, you, you're living like an average job law. Over here, you will have a butler, you will have a maid. You don't have to do them thing. Why do you have to do all the shits? My father and my mother, my father never went to come to United States. My uncle came to the United States during the revolution, and he stayed for two years, and married an Ameri a Mexi Mexicano, and he became big shot in Mexico. But my father never went to come. And there's a lot of people who, they don't want to come. But it's, it's how do you feel about things? Did you, but how did you get involved or how did you learn to do things in the United States? Necessity and sometimes my wife. My wife got involved with everybody, but my wife is a different, you're going to meet her today, but I, I really think that my bosses in New York were a big factor. Oh, we're immigrants. And they came and they make a success of life and they push the people, they push people. Not push it, but they want to make the best of the people. And I, I, I always want for my kids to work to go to West Point. Because West Point for me is the, the headquarters of the United States. And I remember we went to see a game, Oklahoma State and West Point, and we went to the chapel, and we went to the classes, and I talked to the kids, and I saw the parade, and I went to the chapel, I sit down, and after I touched the plaque of Eisenhower and MacArthur, I got, I got a good and uh, Everybody helped each other at West Point. My kid had a chance to go to West Point. He was All America Gary, my second kid. He was All America in high school. He was a natural. He was defensive back, and he got a chance to go to West Point and Colgate. And he was number five in her class, the top of the ten. They invited him to Washington, D.C. and he said, I don't want to go. I want to go to Aspen. I, want, I like to ski. And I, I teach the kids. I bought them a ski for the kids. I grabbed him by the neck and threw it against the couch. I said, you are crazy. If you go to West Point, you never have to work. And uh, he said, I, I'm sick and tired of people telling me what to do since I was 12 years old because since I've been playing football all the league. And I used to push my kids in Little League because I like baseball, but they play football, and I support them. And after he said that, I said, you go wherever you want to go to college. But if you need me, <coughs> come back. But we make a deal. I give you 50% to go to college. The other 50 you have to work and you have to make 2.5 or 3 hours. And after, when he was a senior, he said, I want to take a semester off because I like to ski. When he finished college, I have a chance to get him a job with Shell or with a big oil company. He said, no, I want to go to Colorado or Ventura with my friend, and we are going to pay in ghetto houses and he never went to work for a big company. My second kid, Larry, 
I got him a job with Silomer because they were my agents. And I told my friend, listen, I have a kid who is a biology major, and I think he would be a good kid to work for your company. So he hired him. Three years later, they fired my friend, and they make president my son. <laughs> And after Shell Oil bought Silamark, and then made my son the president of Shell Agricultural Division. And after my son, he said, you know what? My boss is retired from Shell London. You have to hire him. So I hired his boss to work for me for five years in China. <laughs> you know, everything is, is communication. You help people, you have to. Okay. Let's go back to... Uh what year was it that you went to go watch West Point against Oklahoma State? It was in 1961, because I was new in Connecticut, and I was in favor of Oklahoma State all my life. However, about in 1975 or 72, I dropped. Why? They have a Good Morning America. I think he was a football full the foot back from Oklahoma State, and he be become our congressman from Oklahoma, and he dropped off college. And after, in Good Morning America, they use Oklahoma State as a punchline. Why is school going down? He said, you know, the coach from Oklahoma State is making two hundred or hundred and ninety-seven thousand dollars. And the director of science or engineering only makes 67, and he has no private plane. And I, and, and I don't know what, but I, I dropped Oklahoma State at that time. What do you mean by dropped Oklahoma State? I, I didn't become no more member of OSU. I, 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 I was out. And after, I met my friend uh, Richard Price, who was my teacher in entomology. And he worked for Shell Oil in New York too, but he didn't like he didn't like New York. He went back to to Shell, South Carolina, and he went back to Oklahoma State, and he retired from Oklahoma State. And we become friends. And he came to see me, and I fixed his honeymoon. I fixed it and questioned his lodge, <laughs> free <laughs> or oh, half price. But it's how do you communicate with people? You help me, I help you. And uh, my wife sometimes has a hard time with that because I told her, you know, if I invite you for lunch two, three times, you have to invite me at least one. You cannot have all the time lunch free. You have to, and this is really upset me sometimes. And so have you, uh, have you worked with Oklahoma State since then? Excuse me? Have you worked with Oklahoma State since then? Well, I have been working with them. Uh, like I said, I am planning to help them with a scholarship. But, and still I'm talking about selling this corner. And uh, I have been talking about a scholarship. But I met this guy, I think it's a St a Steve Kurto. Oh, I'll give you his name. He came to see me and we click. He's a very nice guy. And he went to Oklahoma State, but he's about six years behind time. And uh, I'm trying to convince all the Harley Reno, who was a big shot with Exxon and environmental. He, for one reason or another, he said they don't allow him to talk in Oklahoma State. And he was an Indian. He went to school free in Oklahoma. And I said, you need to come back. But. I've met a lot of people now from Oklahoma State here in Joplin. Two or three people. That I think it would be good to have all those people together. How we can help the Mexicans, Americans, to make this place a better country. Because I see a lot of changes. What kind of changes? And I tell you, I used to love the senator from Oklahoma, Catburn. I love that guy. He was a straight shooter, but now he's gone. So, what are your your dreams or vision for the future? God, 
that is a tough question because I don't even know myself. I tell you, I worry that I am 78 years old. I cannot take care of myself. I have been talking to help senior citizens now. I am a volunteer in the new hospital, Mercy Hospital, Jordan. God, it's beautiful. It's $900 million project. It's the best. And also, we have the science building. And I am pushing that, especially Mexicans who want to be doctors or have to be nurses, is the place to go. And it's the future because it's so much money in Obama care. And if you look at Oklahoma State, next to the stadium, they have this physical therapy center where they take care of the athletes and they take care of the astronauts, they take care. We have a population, I said, the average is 50 years old and they are not going to get younger. Like the meeting that we saw today is getting old. And we have an old population that cannot take care of themselves. My next neighbor is 86. My secretary is 86. They used to walk. They have to be very active. And I'm pushing that we should get a dog tag. They know your citizenship, your medicine, your records, who are you. So if I collapse, like my wife collapsed, they just come and they take you to the emergency and they revive you. I don't want to be revived. I want to die. I don't want to be crippled in a bed for the rest of my life. But for one reason or another, the hospitals don't communicate. And uh, this would be a good punchline for Oklahoma State because Oklahoma State is so advanced in the astronaut science and therapy that I think will be great. Is there something that you, if you were standing in front of the current uh, Hispanic students at Oklahoma State, is there something you would tell them? No. I would like to talk to them because I really think that, like I said, I am, I really believe that NAFTA, I was born and raised in Mexico, and I work with the Missouri Department of Agriculture. We went to Monterrey, we went to Torreon, and there are so many factories. And you have to motivate those kids to go to Mexico and become a plant manager or become bilinguals, because that, that is the answer. Labor in Mexico, I think is cheaper now than in Japan. When I was consultant for a company over here, I looked Mexico because if you buy a product in China, it's going to take six, seven weeks to bring it over there. It's going to take two, three weeks to send the order. And if you do it in Mexico, you can deliver the product in 48 hours from door to door. And this is what I like CFI. CFI, for me, is a fantastic company that we should get involved with Oklahoma State or with the local university transportation. They have CFI, when I had my Japanese council, the Taiwanese council, and the Mexican, I took them over there. They have a war room, and every day is the weather. He was the first guy who put fax machines and telephone in the truck, and he went first year to Oklahoma State. You have to meet that guy, Brown. But he said, I dropped because I didn't have the money and my parents were poor. And he became a truck driver. Now, President Bush came over here to open the building. But they have this room, and it's a war room. And they know everything about the truck driver. They know how many miles, how many accidents, and how much profit that company, that pension made. If you make profit, you are in. And if you are on their way, you don't have overweight, that you don't have to pay health insurance. And he talked to the driver like he talked to his son. And this is what we need. Companies and people from Oklahoma State encourage those kids. I'd be glad to talk to those kids. I'd be glad to go there or you bring them over here. 
because I was involved with the Pittsburgh University with the technical center. He was Chinese. We went to Taiwan, we went to China. How we develop business with those people? And they have maybe 260 foreign students from China. And over here, I don't believe that we have more than 20 Mexicans. But we have 129 from Saudi Arabia. Why? So, to finish this out, could you explain for me or for the camera the most important or the most meaningful event in your life? This is a sixty-four thousand dollar. I think I I am lucky that God gave me a chance to come to the United States. Because it's very easy I have to say no. Like my, my best friend, he chickened out the last moment. And also I was very lucky to find these people in Oklahoma that helped me and encouraged me. And of course, I hate to tell you this, I give credit to my wife because she followed me wherever I go, she followed me. A lot of, a lot of people don't follow the husband. When I went to Mexico, Beach Bomb, he never said no. Said, let's go to try, let's go to try. When I bought the convenience store, even my brother-in-law, he told I was crazy. He said, you have a neguero. He said, never go up. When I talked to my lawyer, a lawyer we have over here, he said, it's a good place, but you could never make money. It's only make a living. And after that, I met another guy, Larry Hickey. He's another good guy who brought FHG, the German company. He said, it's a good company, but you have to make the best. I, I really think, if you are happy where you are, and if your wife encourages you, and your kids, I'm lucky, I never worry too much about my kids. And like I said, I have been blessed with my wife and the kids, because I never worry about those kids. They were, they raised hell, but you know, I remember we talked every night, what was going on? And when I used to have people from overseas, I bring them to my house. When I have the Taiwanese ambassador or Japanese, they, they came to my big house and uh, we have a party and I brought the teachers from the school and everybody has to say, five minutes, who you are? How can we help each other? And everybody loves it, but people don't do it. I don't know why. Like these people that we saw today, you have to communicate, tell them what you want. And I, I, I love it. And I have so many experience that uh, it's spooky. Like uh, one time I was flying the Concorde from Paris to New York. And in those planes, nobody, everybody's the casual rich. Nobody dressed to kill. Everybody know that you have money. And the next guy, because there's only one person in aisle, the next guy, he said, I have a headache, I don't feel good. And she asked the lady for an aspirin. He said, no, we cannot give you medicine. So I said, well, I have Tylenol, I have an aspirin. I give her the guy one. So we become friends. And after when I get to New York, he come in limousine, he was, a prince from Saudi Arabia gave me a ride to the hotel, you know. How does things happen? You know? And uh, another time I have a drink with General Westmoreland and the plane flying from Holland to New York. And I said, oh my God, I want to congratulate you. All you have done in Vietnam is great. And uh, we have a drink together. <laughs> Why? Another time, I was in Rio, and I saw Sally Fields and, and uh, Michael Kane in the, across this, the aisle. So I told the bar, the bartenders, do me a favor, give them a drink on me. I said, we love people like you. So they came back and said, hey man, why? Because I don't know, it's something that you, it's a, you, are, you have, I, I really think that 
Good salesmen are like the dogs. You have a sixth sense. My cat or my dog, they know who is good and who is bad. My, I used to have a, a dog. He somebody come, he go crazy. He want to kill you. Why? I know that guy come from China. He kiss his hand. Why? Why is? It, I, I really think that you get that instinct in the in schools and in your teachers. This is what I really feel that the teacher should get involved with the teachers helping these kids. And, and it's very difficult because I myself, I have some people that, oh my God, I cannot handle those people because they are so arrogant. And uh, my boss, you, uh, Dr. Stoner, he was a nice guy. He said, he said I don't understand. You talk to all the shit people. Nobody said nothing to me <laughs> because you don't open your mouth. You know? And, and this is the thing that I have met so many people in Portland. And, and like I said, I would like to write a name, all those people that, you know, like Westmoreland and uh, Michael King, Shirley Temple, I met it in Ghana. And my mother used to love Shirley Temple. I have to see all the stupid movies of Shirley Temple. And I met it in Ghana shake hands because we do business with the government. And after that I met uh, Negro Ponte. He was an ambassador in Honduras and in Nicaragua and all that thing. And after that I met him in Vietnam because we were making business with Vietnam. And, and our company was actual, so we were at the top of the list. And, uh, you know, you, you tell that we want to do business with your country and thank you for what you have done. And you send a postcard and said thank you very much. And uh, you have to follow up. Like today, that's what the meeting, you have to follow up. You have to connect with a customer. And I used to have three files, all the people that I met in my life. And I learned that from John F. Kennedy. He said, you have to meet all those wacko people you have in the business card who they are, and how can you use the talent for your personal ideas. I used to have that. And about six months ago, I make I put only big file and burn because I only have now the selected people, very few, everybody is gone. And uh, I think we have to teach that to the new Mexican-American, like my son, Michael. Michael is, uh, 46 years old, they took Spanish four years in high school, they took it in college, but they don't practice because the mother is American, and I don't care. And but they talk to everybody. You can leave the guys alone and shit, they know everybody, because it's communication. It doesn't matter what is your race or where are you from. And uh, like when I used to go in Brazil or Ecuador, or I remember Brazil, Ecuador, I used to tell the taxi driver, why don't you take me to a, a, a local place where you go where they sell local food and I buy you I buy your food. And we go over there. And I never was afraid that I was going to get kidnapped. And they loved me. And after one time, I remember in Guatemala, the taxi driver took away my luggage over there and gave me a kiss. <laughs> and my boss is talking, he said, oh shit, you are not coming there. What the hell do you do with those people? He said, he said, you have to give them tip and be social. They love people who talk. Because some people I, I've born in hell. And uh, like I said, I have an article, why do I like masks? Because some people are so poor they live for today or tomorrow. Tomorrow they may die. And they live for today. And like the kids, I don't think that any of the kids in America have shine shoes for a living. That is a profession in Mexico. And to sell popsicles is a profession. And uh, like I said, you know, to be a salesman, it doesn't matter where you are. It's, and uh, 
all my friends were doctors. They went to school as a medicine. And uh, I always, want, I, that was my first idea. I want to be a doctor. But because my neighbors, all kids, want to be doctors. But in those days, the profession, you went to the army, you were an engineer, you were a lawyer, or you start your own business. And I never forgot, when I was in Oklahoma State, you have a chance to take shorthand or typing. And uh, all my friends over there, oh hell, you said, only the tutti frutti take that class. You should take a slide rule. <laughs> you should take some kind of science, you know, forget that stupid thing. But you see, now, typing is a way of life. When I work in New York, I always have a secretary. And after that, I have a private secretary. That was great. But I don't know, when I travel, I have a notebook in the back all your expenses, how much money you spend. In the front, I have all the people in the country. What was my experience? Sunshine, uh, what kind of person I met, what was the prices, and you have to repeat prices one more time to be sure, no mistake. And uh, now people don't type notes. I don't know, I don't know. Like the guy we're talking today, they, they keep the calendar over here or the note. And you're driving the car, I don't answer the telephone because I cannot handle the car on the telephone and changing the radio. What else can I tell you more? I have to tell you so many, so many things. And, uh, but I tell you something. I have a, a friend over here, he's a doctor, and I love him, Dr. Patterson. And we were talking about that before, and I said, will you change your life to be something different? He said, no, I will do the same. I will do the same. I will never change it. I will do exactly the same. I think selling in America is no place. This is where I get upset. People, People take this content for granted. Really, they take it for granted. And it's the best place, place to live, but you have to make it the best. But I will never change my life. I told my wife, I may kill her and collect the children, but I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> I have to be perfect. But really, it's, it's, it's fascinating because I tell you, this country has everything, but uh, it's changing very fast. I can tell you more after we stop talking about it. I really think we have to keep it the best and keep going. People ask me if I want to run for politics like a representative, and I tell them I would love to run for a state representative, but I need to have a paper sack with 3,000 bucks because I'm not going to play with my poker money. It's very dangerous. Politics is very dangerous, but it's, it's the way of life. And uh, I love it. But, you know, it's like, it's like a religion. You love it and you hate it. What other questions you may have? I don't know. That's it for now. I know. But like I say, you know, if you have chance, you have to go to Branson. I tell you, when I have people from Japan, the Germans, I take it to Branson. They say, oh my God. They say, we love it over here. No, the people from Japan, my agent Nagasi, when I retired, I couldn't believe it. They came to say goodbye over here. And they said, we want to give you this picture or something, and we want to thank you for what you have done for our company. But they were my agents for three years. And after they asked me, we have a very young, bright kid. He has a degree in agricultural chemistry, and we want for him to be a third world salesman like you. 
<laughs> would you like to? We would like to send it to you for three months in the summer, so you can tell him all what you have to do. So they did, and I teach him how to cook, how to make drinks, how to dress, and I give him a job as a maitre d' in the restaurant. And they give him free meals so you can talk to people. I took him to NOLA to read the papers. And once a month, no, once a week, I take a company from this area. And he has to write a report how his company could do business for that company. Now, they, after that, they sent it to India for six months. He went to China. Now he's the vice president of Nagasi and Brazil, running a $500 million company. We have to teach American kids how to do those things. I really think that is the answer, how to survive. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. I hope to see you again.